We are extremely happy to have Dr. Mangione here to welcome him as our guest. And uh, this is also under the curtain of a new collaboration between Studio and Kalmanati and Jefferson Medical College. So you are our first and very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I was telling Dan that yesterday morning I woke up at 3 o'clock to make it in time to Stony Brook to give a talk. And I left my remote control there, so I will have to be, unfortunately, operating this a little bit. So if I don't look at you, that's part of the reason. Um, and of course, to come back, I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning, so my brain may be a little bit still in Stonebrook. Uh, but <laughs> it's an important topic, uh, and, uh, and I think what Dan highlighted by reviewing a little bit my journey is that I'm a clinician who's interested in physical exam. So what is physical exam? Physical exam is when you go to the doctor and they are trying to extract information so that they can formulate a presumptive diagnosis which they then test using technology. And the presumptive diagnosis is based on what you tell them, and that's an art, because they have, of course, to extract information. But at the same time, they also are able to get what we call signs, not symptoms, by looking at you, by touching you, by tapping you, and by listening to you with their stethoscopes. That's what we call physical exam. So um, the data seems to be very clear that 80% of all diagnoses come from that clinical interaction. And the laboratory only confirms 10%, okay? So what is happening now is that technology has become so powerful and also so expensive that uh, is driving the diagnostic process. So if you go to a physician, number one, they're not looking at you. They're looking at a computer. Uh, they barely examine you, and then they order a bunch of tests. And when you embark on that path, it's an expensive path. And down the path, Usually, there is a series of tests, and tests without clinical screening beget tests. And at the end of that path, there is a surgeon, a lawyer, and an undertaker. Mm -hmm. And that's why we really emphasize clinical skills. But to get back to his introduction, as a result of that, in writing about how clinical skills are passing, I got to know that people are still good at it. And lo and behold, they're all humanists. So these are people that paint, that play music, that are voraciously and omnivorously curious, they read about everything. So I came to realize that maybe what is really missing is that aspect of being a doctor, the humanistic aspect. So the capacity to observe, I think, is fundamental in medicine. And it's, of course, fundamental also in art. You probably know that the patron saints of both artists and physicians is a loop. So St. Luke was a Greek physician, hence a good physician, because the Greeks made the best physicians in the Roman Empire, but at the same time was a painter. He was reported to have actually painted the first portrait of the Madonna, as you see there, and then of course he was an evangelist. His symbol was the winged ox, and actually the Jefferson symbol is the winged ox. Mm -hmm. So there is a commonality between art and medicine that has been there for a long time. Typically, we say that medicine is an art that uses science. Now, problem is, uh, we become technicians. Uh, the well-rounded healer that is an artist of science has been replaced by the technician. This is Bernard Lau, who's 98 and still kicking. This is the man who invented the defibrillator, did not patent it because he wanted people to use it as quickly as possible, so never made a penny out of this and then went on to win a Nobel Prize for founding physicians against nuclear war. He is in Boston, Massachusetts, and I had a good lack of spending two days with him. He wrote a beautiful book on the lost art of medicine. And he writes there that today's physicians are more preoccupied with laying tools rather than hands. So what do we mean by physical exam? We mean a student's observation, palpation, and through it all was astute observation, and then only recently percussion and ascultation. Percussion is the tapping, and that was produced 200 years ago by an Austrian physician who was himself quite eclectic, wrote liberators for opera, for Salieri. 
When he was a kid, his father, where at the tavern, used to take him down to the basement and he watched him tap barrels of wine to see if they were fermented. So he came up with the idea that you could do the same with human chest. Now, the guy who invented asportation 200 years ago, wrote a book, was a flute maker, a dancer, and a poet from Brittany. Just to tell you how this eclectic feel and a characteristic of physicians has always been there. Through it all, there was astute observation. So William Osler practiced here in Philadelphia, Penn, and he's probably the last great humanistic physician. And he used to say, all of medicine is observation. But he also added that there is no more difficult art to acquire than the art of observation. Let me give you an example. How many of you pick up at first glance that Audrey Hepburn on the left has a tiara? And that is a still capacity of, so, of observation. Now in medicine you're going to say, who cares about the tiara? But let me give you an example. So I'm a lung doctor, I'm a pulmonologist. And a couple of years ago, one of my fellows called me up and said, Dr. Manjone, we have a consult. And I didn't see the patient, but I saw the CAT scan, typical. And the patient has a big chest mass, but he also has a neck mass. So that's a cross-section, more or less at this level. And you see that there is this big rounded mass in the neck, on the left side of the neck. So I said, great, did you ask the intern if he saw anything at the bedside? And the fellow said, yes, I did. The inker said that there's actually nothing visible. So we went to the bedside, and bingo, the inter had missed that. Jeez. How could that be? Well, Leonardo had an answer. There are three kinds of people. Those that see, those that see only when shown, and those that just can't see. <laughs> now, Leonardo had a sense of humor, of course, and Leonardo was a classroom, but I disagree with this conclusion. The real issue is that there are two classes of people, those who have been taught how to observe, and those that have not. Leonardo had the good luck of being taught by a fellow whose nickname was Verrocchio. And Verrocchio comes from the Italian vero occhio, good eye. And this guy clearly could see how many Verrocchio are in medicine today. Now, particularly when, as I told you, we are now forced by administration to enter data in a computer so that administration can build more effectively, because that's the only reason why an electronic medical record has been created. Mm -hmm. And that means we spend 40% of our time looking at a computer screen and only 12% looking at human beings. This is what is called the McDonaldization of medicine. And Bernie Lowndes said that doctors of conscience have to resist the industrialization of their profession. But that's a different story. But still, it makes the point that this capacity of being artists of science has been curtailed. Yet, there is no doubt that as human beings, we have a hard time seeing. So who's familiar with Otzi the Irishman? Okay, one, two, three, four. Well, Otzi is a mummy that is 5,000 years old and was found in the Italian Alps by a group of, uh, as a matter of fact, a couple of German tourists that were hiking at high altitude, and so this thing sticking out of the snow. They thought initially that it might have been an Alpine soldier from World War I, and then, of course, they realized pretty quickly when they got the experts involved that since we're melting the planet and the glaciers are receding, this actually was a 5,000-year-old hunter. So they brought it down to Bolzano, where I spent six months in training, and they studied the mummy. They brought in the best and the brightest. They reconstructed how this guy might have looked like. They built a multi-million dollar facility to host the remains. And yet, it took them 10 years to realize that there was a stone-tipped arrow embedded in the Cyclidian region that had bled this man to death. So quite appropriately, the oldest European on record was a murder victim. And they missed it. And these were the best and the brightest in Europe. This was a study that was done a few years ago. They were trying to teach students how to become pilots. So they were trying to teach them how to take off. And they say, okay, make sure you look at the cockpit and you look at the instruments and then you take off. By doing that, they distracted them. So they didn't realize that there was another plane on the tarmac and they crashed into it. They wrote a paper about it. And you're gonna say, yeah, but this is not gonna happen to my flight. 
This was nothing more than a recreation of the worst accident ever in uh, air history, which took place in 1977 when the two pilots did not see each other and 600 people died. Why is that? Because of what is called attentional capture and inattentional blindness, which basically means we are wired for disruption. Let me give you an example. I want you to count the number of passes made by people in black in this little video. Only the video in black. Count the passes. <coughs> So there were 20 passes, but how many of you noticed that there was a woman with an umbrella strolling through the gym? <laughs> <laughs> and the result is that when they did this study, only 21% of those that took the test were able to see her. How come they had been distracted? They repeated years later the study with a guy in a gorilla suit. And lo and behold, less than half saw the gorilla. And that is kind of interesting. That's basically what we talk about in attention of blindness. If they tell you, enter data in a computer while you're talking to the patient, you're not going to see the patient. Okay? Now, there is an auditory counterpart, and here's the interesting thing. Uh, if you're blessed with ADD, and I'm saying that because I'm blessed with a little bit of ADD, it's not a disability, folks. It's actually a strength. The term attention deficit is incorrect. You're actually hyperattentive. You're paying attention to everything. For example, when I'm at dinner with my wife, I can listen to her. I can listen to the couple behind me who's having a fight. And I can listen to the other people on the other side commenting about Trump. I can keep the three conversations going. And my wife thinks I'm being distracted. So who's an ADDR? The ADDR is the survivor of Oxy. When our species was made of hunters, and you wanted to catch a prey without becoming a prey, you had to be hyperattentive. Conversely, the problem is that over time, the farmers want the land. And the farmers can sit down and wait with patience for a blade of grass to grow. And they are very focused. And since there are more of them than of us, they put us on Ritalin. And that's the problem. <laughs> so I think you should not take Ritalin and you should match with a farmer. You generate ideas and the farmer carries them through. Now, being distracted is a problem. Not expecting a guy in a gorilla suit to go through the gym, of course, will also trick you. Then there is inattentional amnesia. Stimuli that are not noticed are first seen but immediately forgotten unless you pay attention. And lastly, there is a gap between attention and awareness. All of this means that you got to pay attention. So you have to force yourself to pay attention. And the problem goes back to the beginning of the human brain. Once we are born, we are flooded with information. And the human brain learns very quickly to filter out all the extraneous information and allow only a few trees to reach awareness. And then build the forest based on those trees. But when you become a hunter, when you become a poet, when you become an artist, when you become a physician, you have to let them all through. And then use deductive reasoning to recreate the forest. So, attention to detail means not only a few trees, all the trees. And then use deductive reasoning to come up with some sort of diagnosis. Now, in medicine, there is a method, and it used to be taught, and used to be taught to physicians, but the curious thing is that, as you probably saw in the paper that then circulated, this method also had an artistic implication, and it's called the method of Zadig. William Orser used to teach it to medical students, and there is data in our literature about this. So what is Zadig? Zadig is a novelette written by Voltaire 
about this Persian sage named Zalik that goes to the wilderness and becomes enlightened. Then emissaries of the king come and they say, have you seen the king's horse? And Zalik says, you mean the mayor that delivered a colt that has a shoe made of silver and a link? And they say, yeah, no, I haven't seen her. So they arrest him, they think he's lying when he's basing everything on a studio observation of footprints and didactic research. Okay? Edgar Allan Poe was so intrigued by the novel that when he created the character of a ghost of pen for murders in the room morgue, he based him on Zadig. Now, Zadig was practiced in Edinburgh by this lanky, absent-minded, and handsome Scot that was named Joseph Bell. This fellow could look at you and simply based on the way you looked and you were dressed and you moved, tell you which part of town you were from, what was your hobby, your profession. He even doubled in forensic medicine and people said that he saw the series of Jack the Ripper. He found the murderer and wrote to Scotland Yard about it. More importantly, he trained his medical student, Arthur Conan Doyle. And when Conan Doyle, within seven years of graduation, decided to get out of medicine and become a full-time writer, he created a fictional character named Sherlock Holmes that was based on Professor Bell, and asked Bell to write the introduction to the first book in the series, A Room in Scarlet. In that book, there is a beautiful description of the method of Zadig, and here's how it goes. It's the first time that Watson Dr. Watson meets Holmes. Watson is a military surgeon. He came back from Afghanistan where he was wounded and he's in London to rent a flat. And he goes to Holmes' apartment and Holmes is carrying out a chemical experiment. Looks at him, doesn't say a word, and then immediately says, you're a military surgeon. You, come back, you came back from Afghanistan where you were wounded. And Watson is flabbergasted. How do you know? Here's the explanation. The first part is observation to detail. I knew you came from Afghanistan. From long habit, the train of thought ran so swiftly through my mind that I got to the conclusion without being conscious of the intermediate steps. Yet they were there. The train of reasoning ran as such. Here is a gentleman of a medical type, but with the air of a military man, clearly an army doctor. And he's got back from the tropics because his face is dark. That is not the natural tint of his skin, because the wrists are fair. And he has undergone hardship and sickness, as his face states very clearly. And his left arm has been injured, because he holds it in a stiff and unnatural manner. So he picks up all the trees, and then he uses deductive reasoning. Where in the tropics could an English army doctor have seen much hardship and got his arm wounded, clearly in Afghanistan? The whole train of thought did not occupy a second, and I then remarked that you came from Afghanistan and you were astonished the Brits in those years were stuck in Afghanistan. All right? So that's the method of Zadig. Now, if you use this Sherlockian approach as a physician, number one, it works. Number two, it's fun. Remember the story, and if you have seen it on the papers, we are hurting as physicians. We are the professions with the highest suicide rate. Every year, 400 physicians kill themselves. And that's probably an understatement. Because if we have to do it, we know how to do it well, without leaving traces. Number two, 60 to 70 percent of us are burned out. We quit as soon as we can. I was talking to my retirement guy and said, Oh, I can't see you. you. You have no idea how many people I have to see in the next few days because everybody is trying to quit. 60 percent of med students by the end of medical school are burned out, 12 percent have suicidal ideations, and 30 percent of residents are depressed. That is bad. Okay, so and why is that? Well, again, uh, we're hurting because the system is rotten. This is not a problem of a few bad apples. This is a problem of bad apple barrels. In fact, it's a problem of bad apple barrel makers. And that's a different story. Now, so let's try to practice the method of Zadi. <coughs> Look at the face. Look at the body habitus. Look at the ears, the eyes, the skin, the extremities, the thorax, and the abdomen. And let's play some examples. For example, let's imagine that you're sitting for a cup of coffee and you're looking at this guy. And if you're sitting with a friend who's a lay person, I'm pretty sure the, per the friend will say, God, that person really looks funny. And you are going to say, no, has prominent muscle, 
big cheekbones, a bulbous nose, a prominent chin, and splay teeth because this individual has a big tongue. The diagnosis acromegaly. The individual in the Time magazine is Primo Carnera, a heavyweight boxing champion from the 1930s that eventually succumbed to diabetes caused by this disease. So that is what the Germans call an eye blink diagnosis, an Eugen blink diagnosis. Let's play the game again. Take Mary, Queen of Scots, who was famous for being 6'3 at the beginning of her reign and only 5'2 at the end of it since her cousin Elizabeth I decapitated her. She had tall and slender fingers, tall and slender fingers, pretty much like conservative columnist Ann Coulter. And here I used to say, well, it hasn't been decapitated yet, but we hope soon. Some <laughs> students <laughs> reporting it to the dean, so I can't say that anymore. <laughs> then there is Italian violin virtuoso Niccolò Paganini, who used to play chords that nobody else could because his fingers were elongated and slender. Then there was Charles de Gaulle, who was tall and lanky, rumored to have the same condition, and Vincent Schiavelli. Now, you may remember Vincent, the Italian-American character actor that played the angry ghost in the New York subway in the homonymous movie, Ghost. Schiavelli had the same condition, eventually had to get open heart surgery for it, and he was for a little bit the honorary chair of a society dedicated to the condition. So what did they have? Well, he was also rumored to have it. What they had was what my very first patient I ever saw as a freshly minted intern in a northern Italian Alpine hospital had. They told me, go and do an h &P, a history and a physical exam. She was admitted last night. She's 31, just delivered a kid, and she has postpartum heart failure, post-delivery heart failure, which sometimes occurs, and she has a leaky mitral valve. So I went in, and number one, she had a leaky aortic valve. They got that wrong, and this was a cardiology patient. Number two, she was as tall and lanky as all these folks. So tall and lanky is a dozen a dime, but make sure you're not missing this kind of tall and lanky. I want you to look at your own hands, and you will see that the palm is usually as long, actually sometimes even longer, than your fingers. But what she has are fingers that are much longer than the palm. When you see that, we call the condition arachnodactyly, which literally means the fingers of the spiders, the legs of the spiders. Remember Niccolò Paganini, whose fingers were so elongated he could play chords nobody else could. And then what you want to do is to ask them to juxtapose the thumb. And what you don't want to see is the entire phalanx to stick out. And if that's the case, you have a positive Steinberg thumb sign, which is very suggestive of Marfan syndrome. So I went out of the room and I told the chief of the division, uh, I don't think she has postpartum cardiomyopathy. I think she actually has aortic regurgitation, and I think she has Marfan syndrome, and she is dissecting her aorta without any pain. So they got very serious. They went back in. And they did the only study they could do in this small Alpine Hospital, which was an echocardiogram, they confirmed that she had a double chamber aorta, which means she was dissecting. They put her on an helicopter, they sent her to the University of Verona, and she got saved, and I got offered a job. <laughs> now, the other thing I saw, which nowadays can't be seen for the simple reason, the house staff doesn't carry ophthalmoscopes anymore. She had this subluxated lens, which is very typical of Marfan syndrome. And I could see it because in my pocket I had an ophthalmoscope. Now, look at this kid. He's tall and lanky. Tall and lanky is a dozen a dime, but you got to be proportionate. So, question for the group. And I can tell you when I asked this to the med students, they had no idea. Where is the center of the body? Well, the first thing you probably learn when you have to reproduce a plausible figure is human proportions. And the Trubian man is nothing more than a blueprint of human proportion. So where is the center? Is the synthesis or the belly button? So let's uh, vote. Who votes for the synthesis? Raise your hands. Who votes for the belly button? Raise your hands. And you're absolutely right. It is the synthesis. But this kid is all legs. One out of 10,000 of us have been roaming the planet looking like that. 
But it took 1896 years after Jesus Christ for Dr. Marfan to say Marfan syndrome. Now, this guy was an interesting man. He loved the arts and he loved to go to Venice. And it is at the Galleria dell'Accademia in Venice that they keep Vitruvian Man, which, by the way, is a self portrait of Leonardo da Vinci at 39. Leonardo was a handsome man. And lo and behold, the center of the body is the synthesis. And I wonder whether Marfan got the idea there. Now, this might help. For example, it did not help this poor fellow. So this guy showed up not once but three times in St. Vincent's Hospital emergency room in Manhattan complaining of chest pain. But he's tall and lanky, he's an artist, he looks like a freak, they don't have time. They say, listen buddy, you're clearly nervous. And he tells them, I'm a playwright. And my musical is opening tomorrow. And mom and dad are flying in. And with the last few bucks I had in my bank account, I rented the tax, but this pain is killing me. So they tell him, well, you're surely nervous. Just go home, take a tranquilizer, come back and see us next week. He never goes back. Because that night he dissects on the kitchen floor from Marfan syndrome and rupture aorta. This was Jonathan Larson, the guy who wrote Rent. Did they notice that his torso was shrunk and that he was all legs? Did they check his pulses? The problem with you, Watson, is that you see, but you don't observe. And of course, you can observe a lot by watching, if you take the time. So, the method of Zadig is important in medicine, but I can tell you, if I tell a medical audience Zadig, you get a lot of blank stares, because they have no idea. Nobody teaches anybody in medicine how to see. And frankly, with them, we've been talking about it, it's not easy to teach how to see. I've been talking to a lot of folks who are good at it, and when I ask them, how do you do it? They look at me like if I were asking, which muscles do you contract to walk? They walk, and they see. This guy gives a few tips in this paper, and this guy, by the way, in this paper says, you miss more from not know seeing than from not knowing, which is totally different from what we teach nowadays. This guy was chair at Jefferson of Medicine for 21 years, and he was the brother of the guy who wrote the Flanders Fields, you know, the poem on the puppy. So he writes in this paper, how careful a description can you give of the la personal appearance, clothing of the last patient you saw. If he had been a thief, could you describe him to the police? The people we meet on the street, those in the streetcars, all with whom we come in contact, may serve as subjects, and nothing that trains the power of observation can be unimportant. In fact, it's fun. So strive to be one of those upon whom nothing is lost. My advice is definitely to do that. Okay? There is a guy who worked with Albert Schweitzer in Lambarene in Africa as a physician, and he was an artist and used to say, if I haven't drawn something, I haven't really seen it. Okay? And we actually had a series of classes for our students to teach them how to draw and found them made them better observers. Now, I always tell the students, since they are medical students, so very critical of themselves, not to draw but to sketch. The sketch is supposed to be not a complete finite process, and so the inner critic, instead of saying, God, you really suck, you should be studying for your boards, who always will shut up. The problem is that sometimes the inner critic is very vocal, so I tell them, do it early in the morning. The inner critic is an old curmudgeon, sleeps late, and then, of course, always have a glass of scotch. <laughs> what is very important is you don't do that. Because that gives you the illusion that you own the image, and in reality you have no idea what is there. And a good example of that is John Ruskin. You may remember Ruskin was an art critic, and he was also a watercolor painter, but he loved images. So when the genotypes became available, he bought a camera. And since he loved the city of Venice, he went there 11 times. Last year I saw in Venice an exhibit on the famous stones of Venice by Ruskin, he started taking pictures of Venice, the genotypes. And lo and behold, he noticed that they were killing his powers of observation. So he threw away the camera and he went back to do watercolors. These are the stones of Venice. And then he started teaching people how to draw. Became a zealot of that, wrote a book about it. And he was teaching plumbers how to draw. Even to the point that friend says, why are you teaching plumbers how to draw? You want them to become Rembrandt? 
And he said, no, I want them to become better plumbers. Now, in medicine, we all used to draw, and a guy that did that all his life is Arthur Cushing at Hopkins. He invented neurosurgery. And this is an illustration in one of uh, Cushing's books, of, done by Cushing, of the area that you have to drill the skull to extract the hematoma. Clearly, the best visual thinker was Leonardo da Vinci, who drew all his life. Anybody been to the Bargello in Florence? So the Bargello in Florence is a museum nowadays. And by the way, it's an important point of reference because nearby is the best trattoria in all of Florence. It's called Le Mossace. So if you ever go there, go to the Bargello and then ask, where is Le Mossace? They don't take a reservation, but they are quite good. But I want you to go back to the time of Leonardo when this thing was the police headquarters and prison. Leonardo will spend several weeks there in jail under anonymous accusations of sodomy. He was going to be executed, but then a few kids from good families were caught in the dragnet and they let them all go. And Leonardo leaves Florence and goes to Milan. But I want you to go back to a time when he enters the courtyard as a free man. He's 27 years of age and he wants to see a man being hanged by the Signoria. And he sketches him. And what is funny is that he writes the way the man was dressed. Here it is in Italian, and here it is in English. A ten-color skull cap, a doublet of black serge, a lined black jerkin, and a blue coat lined with fur of fox breasts. The jacket's collar is covered with a black and red stipple velvet, black socks, and then the name of the poor unfortunate soul. Why was Leonardo doing that? Because once again, when you pay attention to detail, the big picture takes care of itself. That's why he did it. And Leonardo was an amazing visual thinker. So in June, I was in Paris because I wanted to actually go to the Loire Valley and leave a flower on Leonardo da Vinci's grave. Last year, this year, is the 500th anniversary of his death. And so I went to the Louvre, and I couldn't even get close to the Mona Lisa because everybody was there taking pictures. But nobody was looking at that. And this is a great Leonardo. It was nearby, so I spent quite a bit of time. This is the Virgin of the Rocks that Leonardo paints immediately after getting to Milan from Florence. So he's 31. And as the classic pyramidal structure with the Madonna being the pinnacle of the composition. But I want you to look at the angel. That according to Kenneth Clark is the most beautiful face ever drawn in life. And I want you to pay attention to the fact that he's dressed in red, in white, and in green. And you're going to say, oh, that's very patriotic of Leonardo, that is like a flag. Turns out, of course, that there was no Italy and there was no flag in those years. More curiously, Leonardo, a few years before, had painted the angel of the Annunciation and dressed him in red, in white, and in green. And if you go to Florence, the marbles of the cathedral are, guess what? Red, white, and green. And why is that? Because everybody in those years could read symbols. They could not read literature, because many were illiterate, but they knew how to read symbols. Red is the color of love. And green is the color, of, uh, the white is color of faith, and green is the color of hope. And love, faith, and hope are the three cardinal virtues of Christianity. And that's why Leonardo was using that, and everybody knew that. But I want you to go back to the angel and notice the funny gestures that he's making. And look at the Madonna. Baby Jesus looks like Churchill. Okay, so how many of you know how to read sign language? Anybody? Now, if you knew how to read sign language, you will realize that that's an L, that's a D, and that's a V. And L, D, V are the initials of Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo never signs and painting, but occasionally embeds this kind of signature. Now you're going to say, wait a minute, Leonardo knew sign language, Leonardo knew everything. He was voraciously curious, and some people actually have speculated he might have contributed to sign language for one reason. When he was in Milan doing this, he was being helped by a family of painters. They were called the Predis. And Cristoforo de Predis, the oldest brother, he was a miniaturist, that's his work, was actually definitely 
and Leonardo had to communicate with them. So this tells you two important things of the observation process. Number one, you got to pay attention to detail. Number two, you need to know a lot because you're only going to see what you know. So yes, it's true, you can observe a lot by watching, but also any knowledge is useful for the process of observation. The more you know, the more you will see. So can art observation help sharpening observational skills? And the answer is yes. So if you go to Washington, to the National Gallery, you're going to see this David of Napoleon Bonaparte, and if you don't pay a lot of attention, you say, okay, Napoleon, and then you move on. But for example, there is a technique which is called visual thinking strategy that teaches you in small groups to deconstruct the painting so you can start seeing all those things that otherwise you would miss. So let's see. First of all, Napoleon was a midget, but David portrays him from lower perspective and uses vertical lines to give us the illusion that the man is a giant. <laughs> and also introduces the bees that were the symbol of the Merovingian kings, the ancient kings of France. So he's also telling us subliminally that his continuity with our great past. Now, so what kind of a man is this man? Well, he doesn't look good. He's kind of disheveled. Look how ruffled up are those stockings. Why is that? Well, it's because it's 4.15 in the morning. The candle is almost out. So the man has been up all night for us, has been working for friends. So what has he been doing? Well, he's a man of action. That's a sword. Maybe we should worry. No, he shouldn't really worry because he's actually using these maps to learn about a foreign country he wants to invade. And of course, that's good for friends. And as far as us, we can sleep safely because that's the Napoleonic code of law. He's a man of justice. And he's a great man because this is Plutarch, the lives of the great Romans and Greeks. So go back to sleep, sleep safely, and don't worry about it. Problem? This is 1812, this is the map of Russia, and he's about to invade it in the winter. <laughs> Not a good idea. But if you do these visual thinking strategies exercises with med students, and you do them at Yale, they pick up 9% more physical findings on the patients. And if you do the same thing at Harvard, they pick up 38% more physical findings. That's why this is a good exercise. And these exercises are pretty much zadic. You look at all the trees <coughs> and then you put it together. So I'm going to use the Sherlockian approach, and this is the paper that then circulated. It's something I found with my wife at the Philadelphia Art Museum and spent quite a bit of time looking at. It's in a small wooden panel that is this size, and it's not always been shown. And the only information you have is Portrait of a Lady by Jacometto Veneziano. And we're talking about High Renaissance Venice. And that's it. So let's try to be attentive. The first thing you notice is that she's showing you the left and the face. Now, that is actually interesting. Because without knowing neurology, by the High Renaissance, artists were prioritizing the left hemiphase. There is a paper published in Nature that reviewed 1,500 portraits, and by the High Renaissance, 70% show indeed the left hemiphase. It's a three-quarter view. And if the sitter is a woman, it's even higher. Why? The left hemiphase is controlled by the right brain. Hence, it's the most emotional part of your face. So play the game, take a picture of yours that has a frontal view, cut it in half, a double each side. And you will see yourself as an expression of the left in my brain and an expression of the right in my brain. And you look different. So that is kind of standard. What's unusual is that she's wearing lugubrious black. And in Venice in those years, they were wearing red and gold and green. That is kind of funny. Also notice that she doesn't have a silk chemise. She's showing cleavage. Catholic Venice cleavage? Yeah. She's missing the silk chemise that was de rigueur in those years to prevent decoltage from being shown. And in fact, the only accoutrement she's got is this yellow scarf. Here's the funny thing. Yellow for the Venetians was a color of shame. 
was associated with Jews and prostitutes. Hence, she's a meretrice. She's one of the 11,164 tax-paying prostitutes that made Venice the Las Vegas of her times. 10% of the population were prostitutes. And in 1416, they had passed a law that forced these poor women to wear an identifying yellow scarf, lugubrious black, no silk, and more importantly, I'm not sure if you know this, she's got no jewelry. And that was also part of the etiquette. So, she is a prostitute. And we know that because in the back of the panel, there is this inscription. And the top is an acronym in Latin, where she is referred to as a lupa, a she-wolf. Which means the lupa, the she-wolf, dedicated her life to lust, license, and duty. Which makes us think that maybe this is a post-mortem. Now, if I were to show this painting to an audience like you, who knows about art, probably knows quite a bit about art history and knows about Venice maybe, you might pick up all these clues. If I show it to a medical audience, they're only going to pick up the medical information. Because that's what they know. So they're going to say, wow, if this is a post-mortem, she doesn't look good. Because she's got this blush, and the first thing that goes through their head, of course, is makeup. If you go to the Metropolitan Museum, you see a friend's house of a Dutch, young Dutch prostitute trying to lure a drunken customer to her tavern, and the little dog nearby is trying to say, run away, syphilis, syphilis. But she's got rouge spitting the nose. Our Venetian woman has rouge involving the nose. So it's not going to be makeup. Could it be syphilis? So syphilis in the secondary state gives you a blotchy rash that is disseminated. And each of those blotches is teeming with the organism causing the disease. That's secondary syphilis. But in our case, it's very focal. And moreover, this painting is from 1470. Secondary syphilis gets to Italy in 1492. 1494, and in fact, the first description of, of secondary syphilis is 1498 from Vienna. So it can't be that. So how about rosacea? <coughs> rosacea, Bill Clinton had a little bit of rosacea whenever he got upset, you could see it. And it's associated with a bulbous nose, which we call rhinophyma. But she really doesn't have that texture pattern. So the conclusion is that the most likely explanation is the rash of lupus. Isn't that funny that she was called lupa, the she-wolf? What is lupus? Lupus is an autoimmune condition where literally your body devours itself like a wolf. And that is an inflammatory rash. And part of the target of lupus is also the hair. Did you notice that the hair is a mess? In lupus, they lose hair. It's what we call alopecia. And lastly, what lupus also does, it gives you an inflammation of the thyroid. Did you see that she's got a bulging mass at the bottom of the neck? That's what we call a goiter. And in lupus, there is an association with an inflamed thyroid that loses function. So you become hypothyroid. That may explain why she's chubby. And she's missing the lateral third of the eyebrow, which is a sign of hypothyroidism. Now, she's a little puffy where the salivary glands are. And did you notice that the right eye is a bit shut? That may indicate that the lacrimal gland is also inflamed. So if you have an inflammation of the lacrimal gland and the salivary gland, you have a condition commonly associated with lupus called Sjogren. And lastly, the red nose and the red ears suggest inflammation of the cartilage. And that is a condition we call polychondritis. <coughs> and all of this could be associated with lupus. In summary, if this were indeed the first description of lupus by an artist who predate the first description by a physician by 400 years, because the first physician that described it is a Frenchman called Cazenard. But these artists that they are first and this would not be the first case where artists see the condition first, although they don't understand the clinical implications, but they see it. 
Why? The better observers. And all of this through a Sherlockian approach. So let's review the steps that went into this. The first one clearly is that you can observe a lot by watching. But the other one is the eye doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. So I spent quite a bit of time with my wife looking at this thing. And then this guy on the left, who is the chair of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic, is in town. And he calls me up and he says, I'm at the Bellevue. Come over, bring a bottle of wine. So I go over, bring a bottle of wine, we drink it. He's a rheumatologist, so he knows a lot about those conditions. I know all about Venice, I have a house in Venice. So together we share our knowledge, then we run what we came up with by my beautiful wife who knows a lot about how people see, and the result we get a paper published. And all of this because, yes, you can observe a lot by watching, but also the eye doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. So make sure you look at detail, but I can assure you, that you're going to see more detail based on how much more you know. Now, if you want to read only one book out of this uh, presentation, this is the book to read, because it will get you intrigued. So, who is Alexander Horowitz? Alexander Horowitz is a canine psychologist. They exist. She teaches in New York City, and of course she loves dogs. And so she used to go out with her dog through the neighborhood in New York, and noticed that the dog was paying attention to things she didn't even see. Then she got a kid, and she realized, taking out the kid, that the kid was seeing things that the dog wasn't seeing, and she wasn't seeing. So she came up with the idea that if she could walk her neighborhood with ten different professionals, and ask each of them, what do you see, they would tell her things based on what they knew. And that's exactly the idea. One of the professionals she walked her neighborhood with is actually from Philadelphia. He's a physician from Philly. His name is Benny Lorber. He's also an oil painter and a musician, just to tell you, eclecticism. Okay, so this is a good book because reiterates these two concepts. Pay attention to detail, but also try to be as broadly knowledgeable as possible. All right, so let's play the game. Let's go to the Prado. When you go to the Prado, outside you find the statue of Velázquez. And as soon as you enter, you find Velázquez in a very famous canvas. And here you see Las Meninas, the maids of honor, that are taking care of the Infanta de España, the future queen. In the background, reflected in the mirror, a mom and dad. But I want you to pay attention to these lonely figures on the right side, because they look funny, for lack of better terms. She looks like a dwarf, you know, the classic dwarf that in the olden days they used to show in the circus. We call those an achondroplastic dwarf, okay? She's disproportionate, and we know her name. She was a court dwarf named Maria Barbola, and despite the fact that sounds Italian, she was actually German. But the little boy on the right is actually not a little boy. He's a 19-year-old kid who has no growth hormone. So remember Primo Carnera, the guy with acromegaly I showed you at the beginning? He had too much growth hormone, he became a giant. But this fellow has no growth hormone, so he never grew. And he remained very well proportioned. Now, are you familiar with another Italian who has growth hormone deficiency, but despite that went on to become a very good soccer player? And his name, of course, is Lionel Messi. Lionel Messi was born of good Italian stock. Parents were from Ancona Marche, although he was born in Argentina, and the kid couldn't grow, but he played good soccer. And the Argentinians didn't have the money to replace for his hormonal replacement, to pay for his hormonal replacement. So Barcelona said, no problem. Ship him over, we'll play for that. And they paid for that, and he played for them. And the result is five Golden Globes. He was still called the atomic flea, but he had growth hormone deficiency. So let's stick around with this idea of boy wonders. This is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, one of the first portraits of Mozart. This is the very last one, and it's incomplete, and it was done by his brother-in-law. Mozart is about to die. And lots of mystery surrounds the death of Mozart to the point, of course, that we even talk about a conspiracy and a plot by Salieri, which was the theme of the play and the movie, of course. 
So let's take a look at Malta, because this is probably the way he really looked. And what you see is that he's kind of pudgy, and moreover he has swollen eyes. Now that is interesting, because you get swollen eyes if you have renal failure. And particularly a renal failure where you spill a lot of proteins. A lack of proteins make you swell up. So people said, that is interesting, because Mozart, and we know that for a fact, had a lot of tonsillitis, sore throats, when he was a kid. And his father was taking him around Europe. Sore throats means strep throat. And streptococcus often causes glomerulonephritis, an inflammation of the kidneys, which can spill a lot of protein. So maybe that's what he had. And could that explain his death? And the answer is probably yes. If you don't add proteins, not only you swell up, but you also spill immunoglobulins. These are the antibodies that protect you against tough bugs, like pneumococcus, the agent of pneumonia. And so the story is that this was winter. Mother dies around Christmas time, 1791. He has chills, he has fever, and quickly goes into delirium, coma, and death. And that's typically what you see in pneumococcal sepsis. Sepsis from the agent pneumococcus that did not get, of course, intercepted by antibodies because the patient didn't have them. Now, if you have nephrotic syndrome, not only you look like that, but you may also have this kind of fatty tumors. These are what we call xanthelasmas. They are really fatty deposits. And so let me take you back to the Louvre. And don't spend time with the Mona Lisa because you're not even going to get close. Let's just simply look at a high resolution rendition of the Mona Lisa. I don't know if you've noticed, but the Mona Lisa actually has exantelasma in the inner canthus of the left eye that was put there by Leonardo because they did infrared studies in the 1970s and this was originally put by Leonardo. And also Leonardo gave the Mona Lisa a bulging mass on the wrist of the right hand, which is what we call exantoma, another fatty tumor. And you see both of these fatty tumors in people that have lots of lipids, lots of fat. They have hyperlipidemia. So people saw that and immediately a wise guy said, aha, the Mona Lisa had hyperlipidemia. And they published the paper. Pretty quickly, this other guy said, well, she had hyperlipidemia because she had primary biliary cirrhosis, which is a condition where, indeed, women end up with lots of lipids as a result of poor biliary function. But the one that is most outrageous is the one that was recently published. This particular guy, who was a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic, said, well, the Mona Lisa here is a mess. She's missing the lateral third of the eyebrow, she's kind of pudgy, and I think the lower part of her neck is swollen. All those are features of hypothyroidism. So they wrote it up, and they got a lot of press. All right, folks, what is the most important word in the universe? Bullshit. <laughs> so, the most important word is bullshit. You got to always challenge what they tell you because many times they are trying to sell you both. So what is the reason for that? Well, the reason is much different. Leonardo painted the Mona Lisa as the symbol of the soul. Leonardo was convinced that the soul was androgynous. And the Mona Lisa is a good exemplification. It's a woman with an androgynous feature and a perplexing smile. Lots of ambiguity. And during the time when he was still working on the Mona Lisa, Leonardo was dissecting fetuses, trying to understand when the soul implants itself. Again, he was trying to understand the duality of the soul. So that's the reason. By the way, when Leonardo crosses the Alps, because of course the church did not like he was dissecting fetuses and pregnant women dead, of course. And so they told him, can't do that. And Leonardo realized it was time to get out of town. And to make it easier, he decided to get out of the country. So he accepted an invitation by the young king of France who was in love with Leonardo da Vinci's mind, put everything he had on the back of his mules, and at the age of 64, which was very old in those years, he crossed the Alps. And when he got to his deathbed, he died 
with these two paintings at the bedside. The androgynous painting of a beautiful woman with a perplexing smile and the androgynous painting of a beautiful man with a perplexing smile, which again, to Leonardo, represented the duality of the soul. Leonardo, by the way, did a preparatory sketch of the St. John that was a true hermaphrodite. And this was actually written up by Carlo Pedretti. He has a penis and has breast, just to tell you that indeed the St. John is an androgynous symbolic figure. All right, this is at the National Gallery in Washington talking about St. Thomas, the fatty tumors on extensive surfaces. This is another friend's house, and yes, that is a St. Thomas. That is exactly what they look like. So let's stick with fingers, because this makes a good point, which goes back to the point of bullshit. So these were made by a physician named Frank Netter, who was also an amazing artist. And he could capture in a single picture pages and pages of text. Leonardo boasts about the priority of the visual, the image, or the text. And this is a good example. So when I was in medical school, of course I had no money, but the books by Neller were so good and they can, could make my studying so easy that I bought them. So here he's trying to describe on the left a man with emphysema mm -hmm. and on the right a man with chronic bronchitis. What is interesting, they look different of course, but when you look at their fingers, the man with chronic bronchitis on the right has finger tips that are clubbed, like the clubs of a drumstick, like, you know, a drumstick. The man on the left, the emphysematous, has normal fingers. Now, in the 70s, when Netter did this, the conventional wisdom in medicine was that if you have any lung disease, you're going to get club fingers. But Netter only gave it to the guy on the right, because he didn't see it in the guy on the left. And he was right. We now know that the reason why his fingers club is because somehow there is a shunt that allows big platelets from the bone marrow to bypass the lung filter, reach the periphery, go to the umbilical bed, and die. And they release some chemicals that create new vessels that obliterate the upward concavity that normally we have. So I want you to play this game. Juxtapose the distal phalanxes of your indexes. And you will see that those upward concavities meet in a rhomboid opening. That's what I'm talking about. That concavity is obliterated when you have clubbing and requires that you have a shunt that sends platelets there to die and fill the hole. So Nectar was able to see it. Now this is an artist that before physicians described clubbing, described his own clubbing. So who is this man? This man is Dick Cat, who lived in the Netherlands between the two great wars, and he died a few months after the Germans invaded his country. And he had the Tetralogy of Pallo, which means he was a blue baby. And that's a big hole in the heart, a big shot. And so, of course, he had major clubbing. And in all his 40 self-portraits, he describes his clubbing. Notice that, again, the angle has been obliterated, that there is a bulging of the distal phalanx, and if you were to push over that uvial bed, it would feel like pushing an ice cube in a pot of water. We call that balotability. Also notice that Cat gave himself features of cyanosis. The nose, the cheeks, even the eyes are injected. And that is very typical of people that have tetralogy of Fallot. All right, so all of this to tell you that that's how we got anatomy. We got anatomy from, see that fellow in the center that is dissecting the cadaver of a woman? He was a young Flemish physician who went to Padua and realized that everything that was written in the books by the great God, he had put it in the books 1,500 years before, was incorrect. But people were still believing him to the point that they were convincing themselves that they were seeing things that did not exist. So again, what is important in observation is that you keep a clean slate. That you are open to things that conventional wisdom tell you 
are there, but in reality are not. Remember, it's the, the, the true tale of the emperor having no clothes. So you need to definitely have a bullshit detector. Okay? All right. And you got to become a visual thinker. You already are, because you're an artist. So let's talk about that. He was a visual thinker. And he was asked towards the end of his life, how do you think? And he wrote, words or language, as written or spoken, don't play any role in my mechanism of thought. My thoughts are visual. Conventional words have been to, to be laboriously sought after only in a secondary stage. And if you're a visual thinker, the worst thing that can happen to you is rote memorization. You hate it. And Einstein hated it. He wrote, one had to cram all this stuff into one's mind for the exam, whether one liked it or not. This coercion has such an effect on me that after I passed the final test, I found the consideration of any scientific problem distasteful to me for an entire year. So then almost managed to turn him off. And in the end, he solved the riddle of relativity by imagining himself as a light being. This was what he called a Gedanken experiment, a visual experiment. Okay? And he concluded that imagination is more important than knowledge. This is Leonardo. First drawing of Leonardo, Vinci. Every brain fart of Leonardo is a sketch. <laughs> Words are very limited. And there is plenty of data that if you think in pictures, you are more creative. Kenneth Clark writes, It's often said that Leonardo drew so well because he knew about things. Much more likely that he knew about things because he drew so well. And that is absolutely true. Leonardo boasted. Here he says, and you got to flip it. Remember Leonardo wrote in mirror image? Actually, he might have been dyslexic. We wrote a paper just this past month on that. He writes, how can you describe this art in words without filling a book? The longer you write, the more you will confuse the listener. And you will only end up knowing a few things. Never the whole. So it's bad mouthing verbal communication. And here he goes for the jugular. Writer, what kind of words will you fetch? to awkwardly describe what drawing can instead beautifully represent. Don't bother with words unless you're speaking to the blind. Don't mess with things that belong to the eyes. Don't try to smuggle them as something belonging instead to the ears. You will always be overruled by the painter. I like to verb words. What? <laughs> yeah, I take nouns and adjectives and use them as verbs. Remember when access was a thing? Now it's something you do, it got verbed. Verbing weirds language. Maybe we can eventually make language a complete impediment to understanding. <laughs> this is, of course, the Babel Tower, nowadays called the European Union. Now, these guys have 28 countries, 24 languages, one actually is trying to pull out, and of course makes communication difficult. But Leonardo had a point. Let me give you an example. This is the first description of a new medical condition by a left brain physician in war. And I want you to see if you can visualize what he's saying. First among the peculiarities by which these patients may be identified is the tooth ensemble of their physiognomy. A pale, earthy complexion, a thick, pitted skin, a sunk and flattened nose, and scars of old fissures by the angles of the mouth often give countenance so much of peculiarity that the condition may be recognized at first sight. The opinion is usually further borne out by observing that the subject is of short stature, has a large protruding forehead, and a heavy aspect. Now, can you see what he's talking about? I can. But this is Hutchinson in England describing congenital syphilis for the first time at a meeting of the British Medical Association. Now, within 10 years, Ibsen uses that to make a play, Ghost. But it turns out that the very first description of congenital syphilis is in New York City. It's at the map. <coughs> and it was put there by Rembrandt 200 years before. So if you go to the map, ask for the lemon wink. And you're going to see this portrait that Rembrandt made towards the end of his life. And it's the portrait of Gerard de la Res, who was at that time 24. Gerard was a genius, but according to the Dutch, had a nauseating appearance. Let's review. He's got that prominent bosset of Parot described by Hutchinson. He's got big cheekbones and a saddle nose, also described by Hutchinson. 
it's got a protruding jaw and it's got wrinkles, raggedies. And ultimately it went blind, which is typical of the Hutchinson trial. So see again the power of images. Drawing is the root of everything. But let's finish up with sculpting. And I'm going to give you my favorite Roman emperor. So you're evaluating a 62-year-old Roman emperor who's truly a Renaissance man. He's actually a medical school dropout, but he loves everything that comes out of Greece. To the point that in Rome they call him the Greekling, which is not a compliment. And then, since he has a Spanish accent, they giggle. And then he has three senators executed, and the giggling stops. And all of this because the guy is driven, impatient, irascible. But, at the present time, he's too short of breath to argue with you. So you notice that his belly is swollen, the neck veins are distended, and his feet are also swollen. He tells you he's had a lot of nosebleeds. So if Scipione Vivarocci in Pavia, Italy, had already invented the blood pressure cuff, which he will do in 1899, you would realize that the guy is hypertensive. But of course you don't have a blood pressure cuff. What you have are your eyes. And you notice that the guy has funny looking ears. So I want you to look at that earlobe crease in Emperor Hadrian. What is Frank's style? In 1973, Sanders T. Frank writes a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine saying, I have a bunch of patients in practice they all have this diagonal ear crease and they all have coronary artery disease. Anybody reported it? The New England said, no, welcome to Frankstein. Turns out, the heavy bust of Emperor Hadrian has them, 130 of them. Whether in Rome, whether in Naples, whether in Madrid, whether in Athens, whether in Florence, and even the golden arios has a funny looking ear look. So let's talk about the earlobe crease. There is a congenital form, and that's not what I'm talking about. Then there is an acquired form. And an earlobe crease is nothing more than an infarct of the earlobe. The earlobe has terminal circulation. So if you clog it, you infarct it. And that's the same for the coronaries and the coronaries. So if you clog this, you're very likely to probably stroke this and infarct this. That's why it's an important finding. Did you notice that this person also has preauricular creases? That makes it even more likely. There is a paper written by that by the Brazilians. So let me give you some data. Lots of studies have been written on this. In one, they analyzed a thousand patients admitted to the hospital. 75% of those with a crease had coronary artery disease compared to 16% of those without it. And 60 papers have confirmed it. So, what happened to Hadrian? Alright, so here we go. The most important thing is, it depends on the age. If you are an old person, this is a wrinkle in time. If you take a picture of Ratzinger, the Pope that retired, he's got humongous yellow creases, but the fellow is in his 90s. means nothing. But if you are 60, like Emperor Hadrian, hmm, if you are 50, were concerning. So Hadrian dies, and we have a beautiful description of his death. Despite his recourse to certain charms and magics, which relieved his dropsy, what is dropsy? His heart failure. They swell up. The emperor soon filled up with water, and his breathing got shorter. As he was, in fact, continuously getting worse, so that he could be said to have been dying day by day, he began to long for death. Often he asked for poison or a sword and offer money and immunity, but no one will give it to him. That Greek physician I was telling you about is not fictional. We actually have documents that there was indeed a Greek physician taking care of Hadrian, and he refused to euthanize the emperor and preferred to kill himself. Ultimately, he abandoned his careful regimen, and by indulging in unsuitable food and drinks, he met his death, shouting aloud the popular saying that many doctors have killed the king, which proved that even in Adrian's time, they didn't like doctors. So he dies, and before dying, he writes a little poem, the only thing we have left of him. Little soul of mine, roamer and charmer, guest and companion of my body, where will you soon have to go? Pale, cold, 
naked, probably to a place where you won't be able to crack jokes anymore. <laughs> Actually, he went to this beautiful mausoleum that eventually became Castle Sant'Angelo. So Hadrian had an earl of Greece, and George got an earl of Greece, because I've been paying a lot of attention to George Bush years for 20 years. And George got his earl of Greece while he was in office. Take a look at this one. Let's magnify the presidential year. First of all, he's got pre rigor crease, which is not good, and also he has hair sticking out of the canal, which is visually unappealing, but also has a connection with coronary artery disease because it means lots of testosterone. Okay, again, if you're young, if you're old, it's a different story. There are three studies, two from the US and one from India, that indeed suggest that in younger individuals, here in the canal, premature hair is a risk factor. Lastly, in Chinese acupuncture atlases, the ear lobe is a projection for the heart. So it is, is a kind of interesting. So you're going to say, yeah, bullshit. George Bush is always on his bicycle. He seems to be healthy. And you're absolutely right. He's always biking. And in 2007, he had an exam by physicians at the White House who said, very low risk for coronary artery disease. And bingo, it just got stented which means that the earlobe knew it all along. This is me 10 years ago when the students gave me a portrait as their best teacher and my left ear is intact. Then she ran for office and I got an earlobe crease. <laughs> <laughs> so, if like me and George, if on an ear there is a crease, do not assume the life will cease. If hair is knotted in the ear, do not assume that death is near. So if when walking down the street, an ear with ear increase you meet, don't give the gent a dreadful fright. Don't hint infarctions is in sight. It's just a respect. All right? Finally, the last one. The reason why I brought up Emperor Hadrian is the guy designed the Pantheon. And I'm from Rome, so whenever I go back home, I got to see the Pantheon. So let's enter the Pantheon. There is the grave of a handsome young Italian artist. His name is Raphael. And here is him. Raphael was born on a Good Friday. And he will die on a Good Friday. And he knew that. He was Italian, he was superstitious, he got sick, he had a big fever, and he knew he was going to die. Vasari writes that the fever was caused by passionate love making to his mistress. There is always a woman to blame. It was actually malaria. So he makes his will and he dies. And then when he dies, he leaves everything to his mistress, they enter his studio and they find her painting. The last painting of Michela oh, uh, Raphael. And he's showing uh, a naked frontal image of La Fornarina, Margherita Luti, who was his mistress, was actually his common law wife. And curiously enough, she's pointing to a very funny looking breast. So let's review. The breast has actually a deformity with a mess, a bulging, skin discoloration, a little bit of a retraction, and a bulging in the armpit, which is usually suggestive of lymph nodes involved by cancer, maybe even some swelling of the arm. So this has been written up in the medical literature, suggesting that maybe this is the first description of breast cancer. The first physician would describe breast cancer in 1800. So what happened to Margherita Luti? Well, first of all, Frontal nudity was unusual for her. Prior to that, she had been portrayed by Raphael fully dressed. And we do know that when he died, she entered a nunnery, in Trastevere, and never came out alive. So it might have been breast cancer, and it might have been indeed the first to describe it. So I'm going to leave you with the School of Athens, one of Raphael's masterpieces in, at the Vatican. It's a who's who of the Italian Renaissance, since Plato is actually Leonardo. And this is a little cameo of Raphael himself. But I want you to look at 33-year-old Michelangelo playing Arachitus. He's a lonely figure, pretty much like Michelangelo was. And I want you to look at his knee, because it's bumpy, which is unusual for a 33-year-old man. There are three bumps. One is over the bursa, one is over the patella, and the tibia. And these are bumps that are not osteoarthritis, it's too young. So what are they? They are gout. These are tophi. Why? 
Well, Michelangelo had that out. Because in those years he couldn't drink the water, so you had to drink wine. And Michelangelo lived on a little bit of bread and red wine, which he imbibed in vessels containing lead. Everybody had Saturnine gout, caused by lead. Same story with Benjamin Franklin. So why Michelangelo? Because now I want you to use what you learn in this little talk to look at this famous fresco with fresh eyes. And I want you to look at that cloud around God. And I want you to use anatomical information. Does he remind you of anything? It's a funny looking cloud, and we take it for granted. But in our literature in JAMA, recently a physician said, that's a brain hemisphere. It's a sagittal section of the brain. And I think there's a nice overlap. So if that's the case, what is the symbolism? Well, Michelangelo didn't like the Catholic Church. This was the time when the popes were having orgies to celebrate their election. Michelangelo was a Protestant before Protestantism. So maybe he's making fun of the Catholic Church. Maybe he's saying that God gave us the brain as his greatest gift. Maybe he's saying that God is a figment of the brain. Or maybe he's saying that the brain is the seed of the soul. See the ambiguity? So the point is that there is a big book written by two Brazilian physicians, unfortunately not translated in English, so I had to buy it in Portuguese, that collect many of these hidden signs in the Sistine Chapel. And yes, Michelangelo was dissecting. He was planning to write an anatomy textbook. So there is no Da Vinci code, there is a Michelangelo code. <laughs> For example, this is the throat of God, which has been written up in the Lancet, is in representative of the brainstem. This I like, is the right heart. And this I like a lot because I'm a pulmonologist. And this looks like the lungs. And this has to be a trachea. So in summary, folks, there are lots of diseases out there waiting for our name. We just have to see them. So let's review. What do we need? We need to know regular proportions, what is normal, so we can pick up outliers. We need to know the, uh, the, the details, so we need to pay attention to details. We need to know as much as we can, so we can see more details. And finally, we need to force ourselves to be attentive. In medicine, this is the man that gave medicine science at the turn of the century. And I always tell the students that we need to revisit the job description. Osler, who was the pinnacle of the humanistic physician, I'm convinced needs to come before Flexner, which means we need to bring in kids who are humanists and then turn them into scientists. If we bring in the scientists, we're not going to turn them into humanists. That's been tried for 70 years and it doesn't work. So what I'm trying to do with our humanities project, what Dan is trying to do helping us out, is nothing more than real guard action. If they already have it, that's great, we can cultivate it. The ones who don't have it are not going to get it. In fact, many of them look at me like, why are you telling me this? I'm spending $55,000 a year to hear this. And that's the sad reality. Hopefully those kids will go into radiology. <laughs> <laughs> now, humanities are the hormones, said Oswald, just before dying. A hundred years ago, the last speech. Humanities and science are twin berries on one stem. Grievous damage has been done to both, regarding them in any other light than complemental. So you need to strive to be a symphony of hemispheres. You need them both. I'm going to leave you with Rembrandt. Last week was the 350th anniversary of his death. And this man was a genius. Rembrandt gave us the very first description of rosacea and rhinophyma on himself. He gave us the first description of congenital syphilis on Gerard de Relais. And if Raphael didn't get there first, Maybe Hendrik Stoffels, his mistress, also died of breast cancer. See the mess there? And I wrote a paper on this haunting sub-portrait from 1659. The paper is on how this represents Rembrandt depression. Because it's the major one where Rembrandt shows the wrong side of the face. Which happens when visual center shifts as a result of depression. So I'm going to leave you with a morphing of Rembrandt's 70 sub-portraits. 
Rembrandt had an interesting life. He was a provincial from Leiden who moves to Amsterdam in his 20s and makes a lot of money. So he buys himself a palatial home. He has a wife, kids, and a mistress. And he collects. He goes to the docks and buys the best and the weirdest that comes from the world. And then everything unravels. At the time that his painting was made, he had lost his wife, he had lost a few of his kids, ultimately he will lose them all, he will lose his mistress, he will go bankrupt, he will lose a house, all his material possessions, and ultimately be buried in a pauper's unmarked grave. And what you will see in this morphing is indeed the human condition, and I wrote a paper on that, and here it is. Thank you so much. Thank you.